So we've introduced the idea of impermanent loss before, and let's actually go through it again in the context of uh, Uniswap. So again, the idea here is liquidity providers, um, they supply uh, the capital. And because of the nature of this constant product um, uh, automated market maker, there will be some impermanent loss as the exchange rate actually changes. And we went through some calculations before as to how this, uh, how this works. So, um, so, this, so even though the liquidity providers are earning uh, a rate of return based upon the volume of trading uh, within the pool, there's also a cost associated with this in terms of the impermanent uh, loss. So let's uh, kind of go through that again. We went through it quickly in the previous uh, course. And the impermanent loss is an opportunity cost. So it is the amount of money that the liquidity provider would have made if they didn't pledge the liquidity to the liquidity pool, but just sat on it. So it's an opportunity lost. And it will happen anytime there's a deviation from the initial um, uh, market price ratio for the two. And uh, th the only way that there's no impermanent loss is if uh, that ratio stays the same. So, uh, so that's essentially um, important for uh, impermanent loss. So again, the fees hopefully will overcome the impermanent loss, but nevertheless, um, this is one of the downsides of any uh, constant product uh, automated uh, market maker. So one way to reduce perm impermanent loss is to look at pairs that are highly correlated. Okay, so when the pairs are highly correlated or mean reverting, then there's going to be not that much deviation in exchange rate, and the impermanent loss is going to be very small. The examples that I used in uh, the previous course were dramatic examples where something went up by 400% and something else went up by 200%. So it's a huge gap uh, between the performance. So uh, literally one of the pairs uh, doubled relative to another pair. So if you think of a low um, volatility or high correlation pair like DAI and USDC, that's just not going to happen. So the impermanent loss is very low for a, a very highly uh, correlated uh, pair. So, um, so this is impermanent loss is something that is well known uh, in the space. So people providing liquidity understand uh, impermanent loss. They understand that they need to take that into account and, and factoring in what the expected rate of return is. Um, and, and they also understand that high correlation pairs minimize that. And there's some protocols that just focus in, on high correlation pairs. But the problem is that people want to uh, trade uh, cryptos well beyond the high correlation pairs. So there's only so much you can do with uh, USDC and DAI. So uh, this impermanent loss is just something that we have to deal uh, with. So um, essentially, uh, almost any uh, ERC pair, an uh, ERC20 pair, is uh, possible on Uniswap. So this is it's super interesting that anybody can start uh, a pair, right? So. ERC-20 to ERC-20. So you've got a new token that you're introduced. Well, you can, you can seed it um, uh, in a Uniswap pair. So it's like instantly available for trade. So think about that in traditional finance, how difficult it is to actually get a stock listing. So only a very small number of companies can actually do this. And they have to go through a very costly process to actually be traded. Well, with Uniswap, it's immediate. You can actually just 
create a liquidity pool, and uh, it might be that you've got a new token, you create many of these pools, and it's available uh, for trading um, in terms of this uh, decentralized uh, exchange. So uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is that this is designed for all ERC-20 uh, tokens, and Ethereum is not an ERC-20 token. Okay, so these tokens are based upon the Ethereum blockchain, but Ethereum isn't an ERC-20. And is that a problem? No, because there are, uh, there are wrapped versions of Ethereum, so WETH. And we'll talk about wrapped versions uh, a little later on, um, but it's just a way to tokenize Ethereum. There's a wrapped version of Bitcoin also that trades on, uh, that operates as an ERC-20 within the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And indeed, that is the one we'll talk about uh, a little later. So, um, so this is, you can, within Uniswap, the way it works is that if you've got the Ether, uh, you can actually use it, but it's immediately translated into the wrapped version of ETH, which is the ERC-20 uh, uh, token. Um, so router contracts, uh, that's one of the words on the word cloud that we'll reveal at the end of, the, uh, of this course. Um, so how is this useful? Well, it might be that you want to trade a pair that isn't available on Uniswap. So you want to do AB, but AB isn't available. Uh, but there is an AC and there's a BC. So effectively what you can do is to triangulate and find um, the, the best route through the different pools to get the exchange that you actually want. And this is done with a router uh, contract. Okay, so, so even if the pair isn't offered, that doesn't mean you can't trade it uh, within this decentralized exchange. You just need to employ a router contract that can do this very uh, efficiently. So we talked a little bit about front running uh, previously, and I want to go back to that. Um, so this is an issue with automated uh, market makers. Um, it is an issue with proof of work uh, in, in general, and that the miners um, can see all of the pending uh, transactions. So it could be that there's a pending transaction that takes advantage of an arbitrage opportunity. Maybe it involves a flash loan. Well, uh, the miner can literally just copy that transaction and put that uh, into the candidate uh, block that they're mining and effectively front run. And again, I want to emphasize that this type of front running is not to be confused with the illegal front running in traditional finance. And this is not illegal because all of the information is publicly available. Okay, so this is public and the miners are willing to do this or they want to do this because this is a way to increase uh, their revenue. And again, this is a downside uh, proof of work that will likely be mitigated um, in the future when we actually go to a proof of stake type of model. I also want to emphasize that it's not a sure thing, that the miner might front run, but the miner might not win the block. And if they don't win the block, there's no uh, front running. The problem exists when many miners are doing the same thing, they see the same opportunities. Okay, so again, the memory pool of all the candidate transactions is open for anybody uh, to see. It's very straightforward. Uh, you need a browser, you're in, and you can see uh, all of this. So this is their game uh, within this particular uh, system. 
So Uniswap also offers something interesting, uh, which is uh, maximum slippage. So essentially, within the transaction, you can say that, well, if the rate slips to anything below X, then don't execute the transaction. Okay, so, uh, and, and this is easily done. And uh, essentially, it is a check in the contract. And uh, if the condition where the slippage is above the maximum, then the transaction, uh, remember, is atomic, and it doesn't actually do uh, the trade. So we revert uh, to where we were. So that's uh, a nice idea within this, uh, this idea where you can uh, specify a level of slippage that you're comfortable with. And, um, and it provides a degree of risk management uh, that's important. So uh, there's lots of possibilities here for arbitrageurs uh, because there's so many of these uh, pools that are available that you can imagine, I told you about a router contract, that if you have got a pair, that um, isn't traded, you can kind of find other pairs to uh, triangulate and effectively trade. So instead of just uh, running on one liquidity pool, you have to do uh, multiple. Well, there's also this possibility of seeking out um, arbitrage uh, possibilities given the network of all of these exchange rates. So this is maybe a drawback, but maybe not because the arbitrageurs are making sure that the, the prices are what they should be. Um, and they shouldn't deviate, there shouldn't be any arbitrage, and just the act of arbitrage is actually making those prices more fair. But nevertheless, uh, this is something that um, essentially the arbitrageurs are profiting uh, at the expense of the liquidity providers. And ideally, you want the prices set in a way that minimizes this possibility. Of course, a lot of liquidity is very helpful, but there could be some pools that are illiquid that uh, cause issues and, um, and arbitrage uh, obtains.